Uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, I'm uh, very proud to present today a session devoted to the nutrition and health. And we have three very interesting presentations uh, on that topic. Uh, there are, we have three very interesting and very, let's say, very challenging uh, um, research, uh, results of which could be presented here. Uh, Damir Esnaliyev uh, will be the first. Uh, person who will start uh, the floor. And uh, Damir working as a postdoctoral researcher at Leibniz Institute of Vegetable and Ornamental Crops. Uh, and at the same time, he is a senior researcher at SDC. He did his PhD in Germany uh, from the University of uh, Humboldt. And uh, he gets his master's degree from the Williams College from the United States. Uh, and he very, let's say, is one of the most uh, well-known economists in Central Asia, uh, specifically in Kyrgyzstan. Yes, yes, it's true. Yes, you have uh, a lot of publications and you work on many different topics. And we also are very happy that you start to open a new uh, direction of the research uh, devoted to the nutrition and health. And yes, we know that it's uh, because of the projects. <laughs> there are many projects you involved and one of the projects you involved gave you an opportunity to work more deeply on that um, area. So maybe, Damir, you can start uh, the session and then we uh, later will have an opportunity to talk with Dr. Uh, Schroeder from Germany and uh, with Nazara Yusupova. Uh, she will be last presented today. Thank Please you, Tanat. Let me share my screen. Okay, uh, welcome to the session. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Damir Isnaliev. Uh, and this presentation I'm presenting on behalf of uh, Wolfgang Stoyetz, who is uh, my colleague at ISDC. Mm, definitely we are one team um, doing this uh, study. And as you see in this um, slide, um, it is a joint research uh, commissioned by Mexico uh, on the intervention uh, school meals project uh, funded by US Department of Agriculture. So uh, in this uh, panel, we also have my colleague Jan, who is now helping us with crunch the data and really look at the numbers uh, we get from the baseline study. And if there are questions later, uh, he, he may help us to clarify some questions. And I also see Tillman joining, so <clears throat> even more that Tillman also knows a lot about the study. So largely what we are going to look is um, look at the impact of nutritional assistance intervention on child development in case of Kyrgyzstan. And um, let me start with showing that <clears throat> it's not very long presentation, but um, affects uh, includes context, research questions. We are going to have a look, contributions to the literature, study design results, and some conclusions. Now, uh, let me introduce you to the uh, program itself. It's a multi-component nutritional assistance program implemented by Mexico in Kyrgyzstan. The core of it is a provision of, of hot meals in schools for primary grade students. So grades one to four receive hot meal, um, meaning substantial meal uh, during their classes. In addition, there is social and behavioral change component. It is uh, directed to households and communities, depending on size of community. Uh, the level of engagement is a bit different but it's an important component in terms of changing knowledge and behavior in communities and households. Mexico supports schools about two years uh, by providing hot infrastructure, but also making sure that there is a sustainability after the program ends. And given a very interesting time in the program in terms of engagement with one group of schools and <coughs> new group of schools, um, we, it was indeed a uh, right time to collect data and already see whether there is any impact from 
school meals on nutrition and uh, education of children. So just to continue about the uh, intervention description, uh, largely Mexico is involved in hundreds of schools uh, starting very early before 2017, the first uh, engagements with kindergartens and uh, increasingly with schools. Uh, so over 150 schools before 2017. In 2018 and 19, uh, kind of big cohorts of schools entering the program, 139 in 2018 and over 200 in 2019. So this study was designed to collect data exactly when 2019 cohort is entering into the program and collecting data from representative set of schools from both cohorts so that we have a school with one year of already experience in, in, in the program and second, just entering the program. <clears throat> so it's a baseline study um, commissioned by Mexico. It's a mixed method. So. Um, Philip, who is going to talk later, is, was involved in very interesting design uh, study. Uh, and <clears throat> what I'm going to present is mostly on quantitative side using baseline data that was collected about a year ago uh, in November till November 2019, January 2020, uh, with a thought to collect data later in about one year, which uh, unfortunately is under question and <clears throat> because of the coronavirus. So two objectives of why we collected data uh, is uh, to have a very good baseline data so that later we can do impact evaluation that is called to have show us causal impacts of the program. And nevertheless, uh, given the uh, interesting time when the baseline study was conducted, the idea was already have something, some insights comparing more or less treated schools for one year uh, versus those schools who are just entering the program. So the focus of this study is looking at 2019 cohort, meaning if to do baseline and endline data, uh, data collection. Moving on. Um, there are three research questions. Um, it's um, no, well, definitely uh, obvious that nutrition is important for all of us and especially for kids who are studying. Um, definitely there is no acute nutrition issues uh, in Kyrgyzstan. So kids uh, eat at home and uh, as well at schools, but definitely inclusion of hot meals programs. Uh, I'm apologize if I'm using terms interchangeably, maybe you know, there are strict kind of definitions, but uh, for me, uh, it's easier to explain that it's a hot meal. This is where Mexico comes and um, brings uh, <clears throat> food, which affects nutrition in terms of providing more balanced, uh, healthier nutrition uh, from the other side it definitely affects health and hopefully we can see some effects on education on the um, studying uh, study part. So first research question was, what is the status of nutrition in terms of knowledge and practice in households with primary grade children? Second question is, uh, what is the impact of nutrition on child health and education? So if <clears throat> a household parents of children are concerned with healthy food and um, balanced foods and probably it already affects child's performance in school and their health. And lastly, we are looking what is effect of food for education program on nutrition on health and education. So FFE, you will see later a lot, stands for food for education. Now, moving, um, I kind of sometimes it's uh, okay. So uh, there are a few contributions we claim we make. Um, so impact pathways from nutritional programs to learning outcomes. Uh, definitely we have a whole report which describes in nuance what we believe, uh, not only direct uh, uh, channels, but also indirect. Um, role of children's and parents' knowledge about um, nutrition. And lastly, um, in what extent this uh, external additional uh, interventions help to improve both outcomes, uh, nutrition and health and, and 
education. So moving to study design, uh, so it could be a bit confusing, um, but uh, what we're doing in October 2019 is collecting data from uh, two types of schools. Um, one cohort is, we call it 2018 cohort. The second one, the fresh one is 2019 cohort. Yeah? And we're collecting data from children who are in grades one and two. So in 2018 cohort, as second grade students, children, already had one year of school, uh, hot meal program in schools. While in 2019, they had <clears throat> no, uh, no such program. So already you uh, see that we can make some comparisons and see possibly effect of one year uh, of intervention. And we collect data from first graders who definitely first time in school and haven't received any uh, hot meal. Possibly they did uh, in kindergartens if they were in kindergartens, but largely um, the effect should be hopefully, uh, meaning in terms of differences in communities where schools are located, uh, hopefully uh, more or less the same. So the idea with October 2020, which you see here in the chart, is that we were thinking that possibly we can collect data and see the impact of the program over time, which um, didn't happen. Now, <clears throat> moving to, oh, okay, I was supposed to show this is, yeah, so meaning we want to see a change over time and see the impact. <clears throat> moving to sample size, uh, data were collected from 154 schools uh, from 3,000 um, over 3,000 respondents, <clears throat> respondents meaning a household, so from one household, one parent and a child responded to our questionnaires. And it was um, more or less 50-50 in many respects. Uh, so in gender wise, it's about 50% girls and 50% boys. In terms of <clears throat> grade, it's again 50-50. Um, and data were collected uh, mostly in Chuyo Blast, Jalalabad and Osh, less in others, just because how the program developed and uh, which schools were affected by the program. Um, so I think this is a main kind of sample description. Uh, moving on to the second part, um, again, as I said, uh, we collected data from two cohorts separately, 50-50 again. And what is interesting here more is this uh, SBC training, <coughs> um, which uh, says that, for example, 27% of parents um, had training on nutrition. They um, had 1.1 1 .1 training on nutrition topics out of five. And they also saw a lot of TV programs on, <clears throat> on these topics on, I mean, sort of the TV. Okay, um, so this is what we have in, from the data <clears throat> and results largely suggest um, that many children have fairly good nutrition knowledge and healthy general food preferences, but also eat many snacks which are often unhealthy. Um, this is to highlight some of the results. <coughs> um, oh, excuse me. So first one, these are four charts which show how certain consumption of certain food uh, may correlate with um, some outcomes. So on the X axis, you have a number of vitamin A rich food. And on the Y axis, you have some outcomes, for example, A looks at school absence. So if a child is given its more vitamin A rich food, the less chances that this child is missing school. The same goes for short-term hunger. So it's related as well, <clears throat> positively. The more useful food eaten, the less, um, uh, less um, hunger, short-term hunger. <clears throat> and in terms of executive function, which is to, um, to do some assignments we did during the survey, 
also seems to be positively associated and numeracy modelist mathematical skills also seems to be associated well with um, so it's one way of showing what we find in the results um, just to illustrate what um, is found in the from the data now moving to more or less table type of presentation so now we have many outcomes looking at <clears throat> nutrition at child level nutrition at home then learning um, so just to let me highlight what we find that <clears throat> the children who are in um, the program in 2018 didn't add unhealthy snacks um, then they know that sweets are not good not good for health uh, they have better dietary diversity at home <clears throat> sorry number of vitamin a food groups are larger and the executive function to uh, to conduct some games was uh, higher and in mathematics they uh, seem to perform better so all the results are for the second grade uh, kids yeah so we are comparing those kids who got one year of program those who didn't have in last year so this is quite interesting this is very positive uh, then we moved to grade one students where we didn't expect much effect but uh, to our surprise which we are considering and Jan is looking very carefully what's going on we find very similar effects uh, so kids in grade one in treatment schools seem to know that sweets for example are not good for health and it's statistically significant so um, there are many kind of outcomes which seem to be marginally or statistically significant and we um, now in kind of midst of thinking and discussing and looking at balance looking whether there's a, a systematic difference across schools uh, looking at spillover effects, if they have siblings who were already in school, maybe that has effect, maybe SBC has effect. So it's what uh, Jan was uh, looking and analyzing. So uh, another thing, and I'm very close to um, finish, uh, what extent social and behavioral change interventions uh, affect uh, all the outcomes we are looking. So topics are the breastfeeding, complementary feeding for young children, dietary diversity, anemia, and junk food. And here we show uh, those communities who, which received SBC to those who didn't. And it seems to be there are some effects, uh, for example, food preference score, number of um, diverter, dietary diversity, and um, some effects on education side. So, how SBC kind of complements a hot uh, meal program is that it provides information and um, awareness and um, other useful information to parents. In that respect, a child benefits not only in school, but also hopefully in, at home. So uh, coming to end, so hopefully I'm on time. Um, just to say that children have good nutritional knowledge, um, healthy food preferences, better child nutrition is associated with higher executive function and numeracy scores. So it's on education outcomes. Um, nutritional programs can improve child nutrition and learning outcomes. And SBC seems to be important complement by improving parental knowledge and nutrition at home. So, this study is unique in a way that we are providing answers to the literature where um, kind of still um, discussion of how long and which channels exist in terms of uh, having nutritional program affecting um, health and educa education of children. So um, in that respect provides um, a good um, source of data to look into these channels of impact. And definitely, as I just uh, explained at the beginning, endline data would be desirable to first explore causal effects of the program, but it's something that is on hold definitely due to the coronavirus. 
that's uh, it from my side. I thank you for your attention. And if there are any questions, we'll be happy to answer together, um, maybe with um, Jan and Tillman. Thank you. I stopped my slides here. Thanks a lot, Tamir. Yes, it was an yes, excellent presentation. Uh, maybe Tillman, who joined a little bit later, can add something. Um, well, and welcome, first of all, and thank you, Damir, for presenting our baseline study. I, I would just like to sort of for the context say that um, on the one hand, as Damir has emphasized, this is a baseline study, and so it's supposed to understand the situation at a given point in time, and it's not in itself a tool where you can necessarily understand the impact of a program. But on the other hand, given that we had an introduction of school meets at different times across um, different schools, we were able to make some clever comparisons and sort of start approximating the idea of measuring an impact of school meals on outcomes. And that's why we are getting a lot more mileage, so to speak, with a single cross section than usual. The second thing maybe I'd like to say is that, of course, against the background of COVID, you know, there's a huge shock um, to the whole education system and to all schools and all children. Um, having said that, um, having a baseline which was just pre-COVID is actually an opportunity for understanding how it has impacted on different children differently. So if we were to continue the study, we could actually revisit these same children and see how under different circumstances in different schools and different parts of the country and with different families having different strategies, et cetera, and being differently affected themselves, how that impacts. And that's in itself, I think, uh, um, given all the negative news around Corona, actually an interesting and, uh, opportunity and an opportunity for learning and so it's not many times that you have a study which so closely sort of aligns before and after a large shock or in this case almost like a natural disaster occurs. So um, thank you Kanat, for giving me the floor but that's just the two comments I wanted to add maybe. Uh, maybe Jan, Jan also can add something now. Um, yeah so um, we are right now at the moment um, looking a bit further into the data so um, as we now struggling maybe to get the endline data to further look into um, how we can back up these results that we've shown you today. So um, looking into um, possible structural differences between the schools and um, further exploring how far we can um, draw conclusions from what we've shown you today. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Um, I think uh... Maybe the participant can raise hands or maybe start just start to asking questions. Hi everyone, Hi. really well Hi. done. I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, could I ask you just to elucidate a little bit about what schools are doing during COVID? Yeah. Um, I'm not really familiar with the situation in Kyrgyzstan and maybe specifically the schools that were included in, in this study. Uh. Given the, the whole team in Berlin, it's probably difficult to respond to what's happening with the schools in Kyrgyzstan. I think maybe Kanat can say something about it, but uh, we also have our partners in among attendees. Elita, maybe just for case to switch uh, Olga and Uma to the panel, maybe they can shed some lights on what's going on with the schools and with the program. About, about schools, uh, it's a quarantine, uh, still in schools, but the first grade uh, children start to go to schools from uh, September 1st. Uh, so we uh, have a very unique situation where only uh, first grade uh, children go to schools because for the first year. But the rest uh, still should be uh, stay at home. Uh, so we have online education. But uh, as I know from situation from the media and from the reports of the ministry, in some uh, distant areas, uh, in the smaller villages, uh, children start to go to school fully, not everywhere. And also I heard that even in Bishkek, uh, many private schools, uh, which is, uh, because they are small in size, they also start to operate uh, an offline uh, regime. So it's a very mixed situation. Uh, and uh, in this, from a springtime, uh, we have the full closure of schools. 
uh, starting from the March, end of March. I think it was March 18th or 19th when the school stopped to operate um, in the usual manner. But maybe also our colleagues from the Mercy Corps could also could add some information to that. Hi, I'm Uma Kandaleva from Mercy Corps, and thank you very much for excellent presentation, and thank you very much for, for questions. Yes, since March uh, this year, all the schools are closed, but um, from September, first graders started attending school classes as in normal sort of normal type of hours uh, using all the sanitary precautions and uh, we able to provide hot meals to the students who are attending the schools basically um, students who are attending schools are continued getting hot meals at schools and the rest of the students who are staying at home and doing uh, online schooling um, they are um, using home meals only this is situation as of today. Uh, from, from yesterday, I believe the first autumn spring, uh, autumn, autumn break is introduced in Kyrgyzstan and hopefully within uh, next 10 days, um, depending on all the epidemiological situation in the country, more students would be able to return back to classes, particularly in the rural areas. This is what we, uh, hearing from the Ministry of Education, once more students would be returning back to classes, back to schools, um, food commodities already waiting for them at, at schools, everything is already distributed, uh, school cooks are trained, and hopefully um, any number of students will be able to attend schools, would get continuously hot nutrition, hot meals at schools. That's the situation for today. Thank you. If more questions Thank related you. to program, I'll be ready to answer. Thanks. Yeah. Mm, some more questions from the audience. Oh, yes, Galip Sanaev wants to, yes, he raise his hand. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Damir, yes. for a very interesting presentation. Mm. Basically, I have a question about regions. In your sampling, you mentioned that I mean, distribution of uh, schools across these uh, regions, oblasts of Kyrgyzstan. What was the uh, criteria to choose uh, these regions? I mean, for example, in Chui, I think there were more uh, schools chosen, and also in Jalalabad, also 26 percent. Yeah. Was there any more schools, or like, what was the criteria? Um. We had to choose from the schools, uh, Mexico has a program. Yeah, so we luckily we had big number of schools from 2018 cohort and 2019. And definitely Mexico is not only uh, agency that helps Kyrgyz government with uh, school meals programs. Uh, another player is World Food Program. So in that respect, um, definitely we were looking effects of Mexico operation intervention. So in that respect, uh, we had to choose from the sites, uh, set of sample of schools where the program was operating. So in that respect, definitely, ideally it would be good to have like balanced sample across oblast, but this is uh, how you adjust to the program, to the intervention and try to uh, make your design of your research uh, valid uh, by selecting more or less equally from both uh, treatment groups, I would say. <clears throat> so that was definitely uh, motivated by the geography of the intervention. Thank you. Okay. Uh, do we have some more questions? Lisa, would you like to use a mic? Um, okay, thank you. Um, yeah, hello to everyone. Um, yeah, I, I think it's amazing. Um, I mean, presentation. Thank you, uh, Damo. And I was uh, very much interested in terms of um, you said that due to COVID, uh, your results of the inline um, survey could be, you know, uh, not that positive at the baseline or in general. So the, the, my question would be, it would be interesting how in general we could, um, you know, integrate impact 
to take into our models the impact of COVID in terms of control or moderating variables? Uh, what do you think? Uh, do you think there's a there could be a negative effect due to COVID and how we can, you know, the impact of, of COVID or negative impact or positive uh, somehow integrate into our models and, and what would be the, the affecting results? Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, I mean, given big if uh, data is collected, definitely huge interest in terms of COVID effects. Um, I think if possible to get information at school level, uh, how kids studied, how much they were out of school, how their food uh, at home and at school uh, were affected with collecting this additional information to get a sense of depth and character of effect from COVID. Uh, possibly it would be, uh, could be done, but again, it's uh, under condition that uh, next wave of the data is collected. And plus the uh, kind of more you go in terms of time. Um, yeah, I mean, could be many considerations to be taken into account, but um, getting enough data in terms of, as I already said, uh, character and depth and timeline would be important to kind of um, distinguish what the deepness of the COVID effect is on health and education. Tilman, do you have uh, any thoughts on this? No, I think that's fine what you said. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, do we have more? people. I think we already have some people who moved from the attendees to the panelists. <laughs> yes. Who else could want to ask questions? Because it's really very, very, very interesting presentation. I also have some, but I want to give a lot to the people who, <laughs> yes, uh, among the audience. Sorry, guys, yeah. Can I ask one more question, if it's okay? It's yes. Quick. <laughs> okay. Quickly. So quickly. you have a you have the schools, you know, uh, with the hot meal and then uh, uh, the schools who actually provide with the hot meal by Mercy Corps. But we have also other, uh, you know, schools who get hot meals um, actually paid by the parents. Um, did you also consider the schools? I mean, should it be the special food with, uh, you know, additional A? Um, vitamin or in general hot meal. Maybe that would also interest me. What's your opinion on that? And thank you. Um, just general note that parents uh, contribute in great or less extent in any way. And from my knowledge, maybe Uma or Olga can also add to that how largely financing part of the hot meals goes. Uh, definitely in urban areas, probably parents uh, can afford contributing more so that kids have um, better meals at school. But during uh, intervention of Mexico, um, it's quite very standard. Uh, so there are standards in terms of cooking, in terms of components of food. Uh, food is provided, uh, the essential components of food are provided by Mexico. So in that respect, um, contribution by community, by local administration, definitely by parents, welcomed improved kind of provision of richness of food. But uh, I think they didn't go too detail in terms of data collection to really collect that type of data. The data we collected was already quite lengthy. Uh, it was probably optimal in terms of getting enough data at, from child and from the parent. Um, so yeah, I think we cannot really distinguish uh, much unless we collect additional data with the help of Mexico in terms of um, distinguishing kind of fun funding part uh, from outside of Mexico sources. Uh, yes, so I think it was very interesting, yes. <laughs> The result was very impressive and we received uh, a number of interesting questions. Uh, from my side, I only uh, want to add some comment. It's not a question, it's a comment maybe that it's already you have some, uh, let's say, evidence that might be transformed to a policy 
uh, advice, policy solution, because you already said that in the conclusion that uh, better nutrition may bring to a better health and better uh, learning outcomes. Uh, that's uh, what we exactly need to rise again and again as many times as it's possible. So uh, by Mexico, by uh, ISDC, it might be raised again that uh, this is a very important. We shouldn't forget about it specifically for the first, uh, um, I mean, the uh, primary school uh, learners. Uh, now I want to close this part and maybe move to Philip's uh, presentation, which actually linked to this uh, project. Uh, I will uh, uh, very shortly present uh, uh, Philip Schroeder. Dr. Schroeder work uh, as a lecturer at the Department of Social and Cultural Anthropology at the University of Freiburg already uh, more than three years uh, before. He worked in the Humboldt University Berlin as a postdoctoral postdoctoral researcher. Uh, he very uh, well known in Central Asia and specifically in Kyrgyzstan. He do a lot of research uh, and um, so he's sort of famous for his gender studies. <laughs> he knows, uh, well, he can speak very good uh, Russian and also elementary Kyrgyz too. So it, it helps a lot to get very deep inside uh, in anthropological uh, studies, which he is implementing. There are many studies, and please, Philip, uh, you can start. Yes, thank you, Kanat. Very kind uh, introduction. I will share my screen with you now. Hope everyone can see. Yes. So um, I will spare you and all of us the time to read out the title because you have read that already probably uh, in the program. Um, to begin with, I can move the slide here. So to tell you a little bit about uh, the background, you have heard uh, already a lot about that uh, from Damir himself, but also from the Q&A session that we have already had. Uh, Mercy Corps has been the implementing partner of this uh, program already since 2003. Um, and it is uh, in support of the existing government program uh, of the Ministry of Education and Science of the Kyrgyz Republic. And if we take the whole span uh, of 2003 to uh, today, then we can see that MercyCo supported 510 public schools and over 800 uh, kindergartens. And how exactly the program is supporting these uh, educational institutions is by uh, rebuilding school kitchens and by providing supplementary commodities to prepare the hot meals. That is something we have already heard about. Uh, and also by capacity building through workshops and trainings. And what has been most important for the very small study that I will be presenting now is the component that is called social behavioral change communication, SBCC, uh, which has the intention to work with the parents to improve nutrition uh, and hygiene behaviors um, at home. So here, um, because I'm an anthropologist uh, and not a quantitative guy, like uh, most of my colleagues and teammates at uh, ISDC, I have pictures yeah, for you uh, here and now. So here you can see a typical uh, scene, I would say from a local activist. So someone who is uh, educating uh, other fellow community members in uh, partic particular aspects of the program, like nutrition and uh, education program. And what we can already take away from this picture is something that might be called the origin of uh, the gender assessment that uh, I was commissioned together with Damira Umedbaeva to conduct, which is that overall uh, Mercy Corps was very happy and successful with uh, the strong reception and interest that it got with the SBCC component in regards to education and nutrition. But uh, what was noticeable is that there was a considerable weak male participation. So only 9% of these local activists uh, were men and those who completed training cycles to become local activists and so to reproduce this knowledge. Um, and so the objectives for our study were more or less uh, defined by that situation, which was to better understand the complex dynamics of gender-based participation 
and with a particular focus of the micro level qualitative data. Yeah? So we're not, we did not conduct a quantitative study, but a qualitative study here. Um, the second objective was to better understand the reasons for higher or lower participation according to gender and other social identity categories. And then the final step, uh, evidence-based, uh, it was to develop recommendations that were actually uh, actionable adjustments that increase the participation levels of passive groups, uh, of course, in particular, uh, male caregivers. To give you a little bit of an insight of how the field uh, research was conducted, uh, it occurred in October 2019. In total, we uh, conducted 57 qualitative so-called in-depth interviews which had a length of between 20 and 30 minutes approximately each. Uh, and it followed a baseline, uh, a guideline of questions that we uh, drafted before, that we tested and then finalized before going to the field work. Uh, in total, we worked in 11 village settings in Kyrgyzstan, five in the northern part of the country and six in the southern part of the country. And um, the 56 respondents to our uh, guideline were among them were 32 males and 25 female respondents. Uh, most respondents, uh, we have to add, is that uh, they had uh, experience with the program, so they had in depth knowledge about what was going on, and or they were associated with the school, which means that they were either uh, taking part in the program in the capacity of being a teacher. Uh, some even participating with the capacity of being a security guard uh, at the school. So many of the respondents that we had in the study were somehow associated with the school as a more comprehensive setting. And all the research communities that uh, we looked at and where we traveled to, they were participants of the program uh, itself. So what were our findings? Um, the first finding is that uh, there is a gender sensitive discourse. Uh, what we mean by that is that uh, male and female caregivers agreed uh, that the care for a child's nutrition, education and social upbringing should be a joint activity. Yeah? So there was no opposition uh, along the lines of something being a female task yeah? and this other thing being a male task. Uh, so there was actually uh, agreement uh, in terms of a discourse about this. Uh, to illustrate that with a quote, uh, I have put that here for you, um, is both mother and father should have direct responsibility in the upbringing and development of the child. The father must know what the child wants, what it dreams about, what it needs, what education it wants. Yeah? Uh, is not only said about uh, the relationship between male and female caregivers, but what's actually uh, voiced by a male activist, yeah, which I thought was very interesting to follow. So from that, we developed uh, a first recommendation, which um, might seem a little bit general in the beginning, but it will be refined uh, throughout the presentation. You can follow that. So what we recommended to the program is that it can draw on this established and also unchallenged discourse uh, of gender equity aspiring a balanced and fair labor sharing in terms of caring for children's nutrition and education. This was the first finding. Then the second finding moved a little bit from uh, talking about gender equity in uh, nutrition and education and looked a little bit more at the everyday life practice uh, of what we can see. And in everyday life, we can see that female caregivers uh, had significantly more responsibilities in these domains of nutrition and education, uh, especially in the case, in those cases when the male was the sole uh, breadwinner of the family. Uh, what might be uh, additionally an interesting aspect is that um, in practice, women were understood to be responsible for the execution of this care. Yeah? So they were uh, there on an everyday basis, doing homework, picking the children up from school, bringing them from school and so on. While um, the male position was rather described as providing the circumstances that should enable women to execute that care. 
Mm, what we can also see is that males were more participative in cases when both caregivers worked. Uh, so if a woman uh, had also contributed to the household income, then the male was in a position of having to contribute a bit more than if that was not the case. But, and this is a refinement of, of this general uh, conclusion, the male involvement in these domains always remained conditional and reactive. So the male understanding of participation was to fill in in case uh, the women were not available, the woman was at work, um, and also uh, conditional in terms of that the female responsibility extended beyond um, the own uh, mother of the children and included also the grandparents. Yeah? So we had cases in which um, male and female participants of the research voice to us that um, before a man would take over this task, uh, the grandmother would take over the task. Yeah? So in that sense, it is also uh, conditional across or beyond a single generation. Yeah? So the recommendation that we formulated from that was that the program could utilize informal associations that, existing, that are existing between the household, the school, uh, and the community. So the uh, aspiration would be to convince male caregivers towards more participation, starting from the school and local community institutions. I will speak about which kind of community institutions we can think about here in a minute. Um, but starting from school and community institutions, we could see uh, that also the role of men in these domains of nutrition and education could be increased in the private households. While in contrast, if we separate it and we strictly focus on the private household, it might seem more difficult to activate um, those men towards these uh, tasks and participation in these domains. Uh, the third finding, which uh, to be very open and honest was the most interesting to me, um, is that in all the local communities, we found at least some men who could be considered non-mainstream males or male activists um, who are locally known as to be different, yeah, because they had a critical, they were critical of the conservative indifference uh, towards these uh, gender equity practice and in practice, which means that they were against shifting tasks of education and nutrition uh, simply onto women's shoulders and then in, by consequence forget about them afterwards. Um, it was then interesting to follow that such a wider view of these uh, different men was not related to the level of education or the level of the income necessarily, but rather to personal experience uh, that they had made uh, sometime along their life which led them to prioritize their children's future over their personal comfort. And some of these uh, examples were that um, some of the different men had experience in migration to Russia. So uh, they voiced towards us seeing how children are uh, brought up in a more gender equitable way in Russia was uh, an illustrative example for them. Um, one man, for example, said that he was, uh, he was, he's an orphan and growing up without a father um, actually made him realize that he should um, fulfill this role in a different way. Or another man said that uh, he had a very caring own father, and so he would follow this example. Yeah, that was something that we found very interesting. The recommendation that we can draw from this is that the program can promote alternative masculinities to the mainstream one. Uh, how to do that, for example, uh, by employing a narrative approach to build up these non-mainstream male caregivers as graspable role models. Yeah? Graspable means in that sense, not someone who is uh, distant yeah? uh, in the capital, uh, I don't know, someone who is famous for something, but someone who is a neighbor, yeah? but is a graspable role model of uh, a different a non-mainstream approach and also to empower these alternative um, masculinities. And the empowerment is of course something that is uh, tricky to do, but um, it could be done, that was our uh, understanding, if these um, 
uh, different men would be endorsed by everyone who is considered to be an authority in a local way. That can be an official representative, that could be a religious leader, that could be a school director. Yeah. So if they were promoted as uh, positive role models by other men who were considered to have local authority. Um, yes, this is another impression of possible uh, different men, so to say. Um, our finding number four was uh, that having no time is a well-known but a powerful pretext to avoid being active as a man in the domains of nutrition uh, and education. So men not having time to do that, uh, we found out was not necessarily an objective measure of time budget, but rather a subjective assessment that assigned more value to male time than to female time. And in particular, if uh, this male time was spent earning a living. Yeah? Uh, this is a hierarchization of time yeah, in which um, earning uh, time was considered to be more valuable than time that was spent in the household. Yeah? Um, interestingly then, uh, that's why the conclusion was that it's a well-known pretext is that 21 out of 44 respondents who uh, answered to that question in our interviews uh, clearly identified that um, not being interested was the real reason why men would not participate in these domains. Um, and at the same time, despite that this is a known pretext, uh, employing it uh, actually was found to have few consequences, which means like everyone knows it's an excuse, but using it would not change anything. Yeah? And uh, this is also visible by the fact that uh, when we ask respondents what could be done about this, uh, if it's such a well-known excuse, then uh, there was a big difficulty to imagine what could be a feasible workaround yeah, or means of addressing this. So uh, the recommendation that we concluded from there was to deconstruct the no time pretext yeah, because actually it lacks moral justification. Yeah? There is no cultural or religious um, resource that could be pointing to it being okay that men are not having time to care for the education and nutrition of their children. And um, uh, comprehensive also to deconstructing this, it is to highlight the duty that everything should be done for the sake of the children, which is a very uh, widespread notion yeah, in Kyrgyzstan as elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, another recommendation that is related to time was that uh, program activities could adjust to the seasonal variation of male time budget, which uh, for example, say that men are more free during the winters than during the summers because of the agricultural cycles or also because of international labor migration uh, patterns. Then uh, moving towards a little bit uh, the conclusions, was uh, what are the ways to increase male caregivers involvement. So uh, one recommendation that we had was to empower the intimate social surrounding of male caregivers, yeah? which is to strengthen the voices of children and females and wives yeah? uh, as social actors. And that was something that we found very strongly in the interviews that uh, a situation in which a child is asking for the support of a father, for example, doing homework, it will be different, uh, difficult for him to reject this. This is a little bit behind that. Um, then uh, the increase of male responsibility through community institutions, which basically means that uh, a collective approach towards um, activating men could be considered to be uh, something that promises uh, success if we draw on local and collective notions of responsibilities. Um, in our interviews, we asked which kind of local uh, authority institutions um, respondents could think of um, that could promote such a change in behavior among men. And um, these were the Imam, so um, the, the local Muslim cleric, uh, self-administration representatives, local elders or village heads, but also people who are uh, successful in the economic or the political sphere, so businessmen or people who are deputies in the local or national parliament even. So um, what we wanted to do is that we create opportunities for positive male inclusion. Yeah? Uh, 
Um, methodologically, what might be interesting is that in the interviews we here worked uh, with thought experiments. Yeah, so we were asking uh, male and female respondents, what if there was something such as a competition, my father and I. And um, uh, the response was that many men uh, actually acknowledged that they would uh, participate in such a competition. And also wives uh, considered it possible that their husbands would participate in these, comp in these kind of competitions. And also 44% uh, of respondents believed that male caregivers would uh, attend a training that would be labeled good father, yeah? which would be something uh, along the lines of what I said before, that it involves community institutions from the school to um, uh, also the household and uh, other aspects. And then uh, final slide, general conclusions is that um, we would, re we recommended actually that men uh, would be enabled to take steps out of their patriarchal comfort zones and that they can be, so to say, empowered to experience a positive fatherhood. That is also something that we found in the voices of those uh, who I labeled the different men, yeah, who actually said, well, once I dared to get involved more deeply with my child in terms of uh, nutrition and education, I had a very positive and uh, empowering experience with it. Yeah. Um, the next thing uh, that could be done is to strengthen the notion of a parental piety that is complementing the notion of a filial piety. The filial piety might be uh, something that is well known, uh, for example, saying uh, children should respect um, their parents. Yeah? The question then is, and that leads me to the next point, is um, programs should uh, achieve a balance between showing respect and showing responsibility, which are the guiding principles underlying social and other exchanges. Yeah? To explain that a little bit is um, there could be the understanding that respect is earned. By, be, by showing responsibility and not respect is automatically given or is expected to be automatically given just because someone is senior, senior to someone else. Yeah? That was kind of the, the thought behind that recommendation. And then um, lastly, but of course very important, uh, what has to be considered in terms of avoid to do harm uh, when uh, thinking about uh, these recommendations and considering them? is that uh, no measure should be done to single out and ostracize larger groups of men yeah, um, in these local communities. Uh, the second one is that, of course, uh, a, no, a program should not disregard the secularity principle. Yeah, uh, If you think about uh, the fact that uh, the imam was considered to be a local authority figure, we should not uh, forget that there is a separation between private religious representation and the public domain of school education. And uh, the third one, which I think is also very uh, important, is that a program should not unduly challenge the role of female caregivers, uh, because especially if they are housewives, uh, we should not underestimate the thought that their contribution might be considered by themselves to be the key contribution of what they give to the family. And so there might be actually tendencies also we should explore that um, they might protect this domain from too much male involvement. Yeah. And that was it. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Philip, for this presentation. It was very interesting to <laughs> look again uh, for, uh, by the anthropologist uh, in an overview of the position of a man and woman in Kyrgyz family, uh, specifically of the distribution of responsibilities uh, and participation of men uh, in the uh, family life. Uh, can we, um, let's say, yes, invite people to raise their hands? And because it was extremely interesting for me, yes, to hear all your thoughts and very detailed analysis. Please start to ask. Okay. Tillman also in the line. Okay, do you want me to start? Or? Yes, please yeah. start. All right, okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Philip. Uh, it's really fascinating. And um, I love the 
sort of slightly conflicting, you know, yes, we're caring together, but sometimes I'm just too busy to help uh, type, uh, you know, um, it sounds very realistic, yeah, that sort of <laughs> ambiguous finding, yeah. Um, <clears throat> I suppose um, you answered it in part already, but it's a difference between sort of observing what norms rule and knowing how to change these norms. Do you have any more thoughts on, you know, how best to change norms and perhaps other, other examples of interventions you're aware of in, in similar context, which actually try to do so because presumably these norms grew over you know centuries slowly steadily and evolve and you know some norms change incredibly quickly and others are extremely sticky so what's your advice as a social mm. anthropologist for how to change thank you well as, as a social anthropologist i have to answer of course that every local context is different from the other yes yeah? so there are no global answers in anthropology um, but uh, giving an answer maybe for the Kyrgyz context is that um, is that we, of course, should develop these changes from what is already existing. Yeah, that's what I tried to point out in the, in the last slide. Yeah, showing respect and showing responsibility are very established notions yeah, in the local community. And how we can create maybe a tipping point is if we balance two things. Yeah, the one thing is that usually there is the aspiration that, especially in, in rural communities, uh, social harmony yeah, should be maintained yeah, in Tamak, yeah, in, in Kyrgyz. Yeah? So there's, that's why I said it's very important also not to ostracize yeah, a group of men and say, you're the culprits, yeah, you should change and so on. But um, what goes along the social harmony is a matter of the group size. Yeah? So if you gradually create um, a sizable group, maybe not a majority, yeah, but a sizable group uh, who is acceptably different, yeah, like these different men, yeah, so not one of them, not two of them, but maybe already 10, 15, 20, I don't know what the right number would be. I think that is something where you can initiate maybe a gradual and also acceptable change that at the same time avoids doing harm. I, I don't know whether that answered your question, but... Yes, yes, I think yes. Ah, okay. uh, we have <laughs> also some more questions, yes. I think was that was Ainura who Ainura Smaila who raised it. They have no. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Philip, for a great presentation. And I'm interested in the transcribing part since I'm a PhD student and going to conduct interviews as well. So you said you have conducted 57 in-depth interviews, and for transcribing, what kind of software program did you use? Is it uh, NVivo, Atlas TI, or? Did you just use the traditional way of transcribing using Word? You mean you mean for the transcription, or you mean for the data analysis? Data analysis, yeah. Okay, um, we could use something like um, Max QDA. That is something that uh, I, I think is a very powerful instrument, yeah, to create codes, yeah, and then move on from the codes uh, towards a deeper analysis. But to my knowledge, Atlas TI is much different from Max QDA. Okay, it was more methodological question. Yeah. I don't know if yeah. there's a follow-up question, I'm happy to answer. But... Yes. Some more questions? No? Yes, can I uh, ask? Yes, yes. Can I Vera, ask? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. It was very interesting research. Uh, uh, so um, I, my question is about uh, behavioral change, uh, how we can uh, change the behaviors of uh, parents, uh, specifically fathers. Yeah, this is all value change, uh, how to transform uh, traditional values uh, of Kyrgyz men. Uh, through education or through uh, family, because it's a very complex issue. Uh, uh, you know, the uh, mothers of these men uh, are very critical uh, in uh, uh, raising uh, this socialization uh, process of, of a uh, kid, yeah, uh, of a son. Uh, so uh, beginning from early age, they don't teach them how to do household uh, uh, duties yeah and when they get married uh, their mothers started 
telling them uh, not to be involved in household uh, works, that this is the obligation and duty of a daughter-in-law and that they should not uh, be involved and uh, that uh, even just talking to their kids, uh, uh, not just helping, but even uh, talking uh, about their expectations, uh, uh, they don't talk. Kyrgyz men spend only four minutes with their kids, yeah? Uh, according to uh, latest research. So how to change this behavior of Kyrgyz men uh, to talk to their kids and to take care and to be involved in the raising uh, process, I mean, in, in uh, Tarbiya, in Kyrgyz, yeah, Tarbiya. So, uh, so how to change this? Uh, because it's all uh, religious also beliefs are important. Uh, now uh, our Kyrgyz men are becoming more religious and uh, these are also dictated by religion also and by their mothers, by their family members and uh, also um, how to change all of this because this is all complex issue, I think. Yes, I definitely agree. It's a very, very complex issue. And uh, the earlier it would start in, in childhood socialization, uh, the better. But I think partially I already gave a bit of an answer. Yeah, I think um, maybe to frame it differently, uh, we should look at the individual level yeah, to some degree, which means like, uh, why does a man, I mean, very interesting what you said, why does a Kyrgyz man only spend four minutes I guess a day, yeah, um, uh, with his uh, child or children, yeah. And what I found out, not in that particular research, but in, in other researches, is that a lot of times there is a certain anxiety, yeah, that um, men do not know or believe that they would not know what to do with that child. So they are actually afraid that there might be a situation in which they uh, cannot handle the situation. And I don't mean in terms of cooking a meal, but maybe in terms of playing or reading. So they are not um, confident about their own abilities of uh, socially interacting with the child. Yeah? So I think that is uh, one, just one example of an individual reason that we might explore further yeah? to which degree that is the case. Yeah? Um, the other thing is how could we activate um, more men? I think, um, that's the other answer I gave is that we should look at it in terms of a community approach yeah, next to the individual approach yeah, in terms of uh, looking at people who are considered to be uh, authority figures uh, in, the, in the local setting. And I don't mean authority figures in terms of that they just simply tell fathers that they should and have to and uh, look after their children. But in, that's why I said in, in a positive way to motivate them yeah, to do that and that it's actually very uh, valuable and that is uh, something that we figured out in that research is happening to men who are all of a sudden in that position yeah because uh, let's say maybe uh, the wife has the opportunity to earn uh, a decent living yeah and so is absent for some time and all of a sudden there is no escape yeah and then they are confronted with that situation they are resolving it and they are taking a lot of uh, personal satisfaction out of it yeah we should, I think, really promote these kind of um, examples. And that's uh, what I meant with also graspable examples. Yeah, not someone who is a, I don't know, uh, maybe a movie or music star somewhere in the distant capital, yeah, but someone who is uh, really a neighbor yeah? or even a family member or relative. Yeah, uh, oh, he did it, I can do it too. Yeah, that kind of thing. What uh, also I didn't say in the presentation, but what came as a response when we had these thought experiments about possible competitions where men could participate, there was the competitive element that men really liked. Yeah? And they said, well, if it's a competition, uh, my child and I, yeah, or my father and I, from the perspective of the child, then we can participate. Yeah? So the competitive element was something that was really attractive to them. And the second one is that uh, if they could get a gratification for this. Yeah? I don't know, father of the month, yeah? I don't know, a kind of a certificate that they participate. That was something really important to them, yeah? Um, and maybe it's also these micro uh, details, yeah, that, that uh, are worthwhile pursuing, yeah? Sorry, that was a long answer, but it was also a very good question. 
Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry, um, well, uh, my second question, if I may, yeah, if I may. Now, social media, uh, all fathers are sitting in Facebook or Instagram, Telegram. They are spending more time on social media than with their kids, and they are already addicted. And how we can uh, uh, challenge this, how we can stop uh, them to spend more time with social me media? Well, I, I think this question definitely goes way beyond Kyrgyzstan. Yeah, <laughs> um, uh, maybe the maybe the solution is to use the social media uh, to get rid of it, <laughs> to do it like a Trojan horse kind of approach. Yeah, um, if Instagram tells you to drop your phone, what will happen? Yeah, it's kind of a funny answer, but um, it's it's really a very big question. But maybe that would be a question that my colleagues from Mercy Call, yeah could answer how they are maybe using social media channels to in, in their uh, SPCC approach. Just uh, okay. reply to Philip's um, uh, comment about usage of social media. Yes, we, we are using social media channels very intensively for our health, behavior change uh, as behavior change approach. We are using Facebook page. We develop Facebook page on a local language, on Russian language. And uh, we are using very actively WhatsApp groups and uh, trying to send messages and encourage community members, not exclusively males, but all of them through the social media sort of jointly. We know that it's working and uh, TV channels are used by us very intensively. We are putting uh, very interesting interactive uh, um, uh, video spots where we, we use even uh, local um, local artists to to for, for scripts and local artists are actually addressing this issue sort of acting as a local family they're addressing issue of ma father walking or reading with the son and father doing some some joint activity with the son and how it's perceived by by his mother, sort of mother-in-law in the family, and his wife. That's a very interesting uh, short videos, which we are using as like positive events type of message through the social media and through the TV channels. Very good, very interesting. Thank you. Maybe, so some, some, somehow <laughs> you answered on the previous question, yes. So, uh, maybe, so Jan, you also have some question. Uh, yeah, I wanted to ask if you looked to some extent into how far these beliefs into how a man or woman should be involved uh, in caring for their kids are, um, are um, given further to the children. So um, like how far the beliefs of the father or the mother already influence the children. I don't know if you looked at that. But, um, no, not, not in that particular kind of study, but um, so I cannot uh, you know, base that on, on kind of substantive results. But of course, uh, there is a certain logic to it yeah, that uh, if you have that kind of uh, talking about uh, gender equity uh, discourse yeah, of, of sharing these tasks, but a practice that says or does otherwise, yeah, um, then of course that um, leads to the problem that it continues further yeah, in, in the next generations, even uh, if there are slight uh, adjustments to that. Yeah. So there are still a lot of things should be done for the next several generations in terms of yes, bringing to real equity between men and women. Uh, I heard, uh, I read one article and uh, one of the specialists estimates that we need at least 100 years to pass and inequality. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, it's probably not even our kids will see it, maybe our, let's say, grandchilds, and maybe their grand grandchilds. So, but finally, we, uh, since it started, we, I think we are moving in the right direction in terms of gender studies, and we you bring a lot to this discussion. Uh, and uh, maybe we can uh, close uh, in this part of our session and move further. And the last presentation will be done by Vinazir uh, Bono Yusupova. Uh, she uh, get her master degree from the University of Sussex, and she's continuing to be there as a uh, teaching assistant uh, for quantitative methods. 
uh, I think uh, is four years. And um, as already Samir mentioned, uh, we're very proud uh, that Latin Kyrgyzstan become the, let's say, source of valuable information and provides a lot of uh, interesting data where many, many different researchers can use it to provide us uh, new findings and uh, bring some more light uh, in the analysis. And please start. Thank you very much, Kanat. Uh, so my study uh, is on women's bargaining power in child nutrition, and I use the evidence based on life interview survey. And uh, today's presentation, I'll start with a statement of the problem, why I chose that uh, particular topic, and then I'll cover research questions. I'll briefly cover scope and limitations of my study, and then I'll uh, explain the results and move to conclusions. So uh, why child nutrition? We know that child nutrition remains a global problem, especially in lower and middle income countries. And here is the map of the prevalence of stunting. The stunting is the measure when the height for the age of the child is lower than uh, it should be. So, and this is the map of Central Asia. And we see that the prevalence ranges from 10% to even 50% in some regions. And the average uh, prevalence of stunting, according to Global Nutrition Report in 2019, was around 11% in Central Asia. And uh, in addition, uh, undernourishment remains an issue. And unfortunately, in that direction, we are moving backward, not forward. So the levels of undernourishment did um, in increase, the prevalence increases. So this is why I decided to concentrate on child nutrition. So, and why women's bargaining power? So what is that? So bargaining power is, um, is the power of a woman to act for her own, uh, uh, it's how she can act uh, for, in order to get resources that she wants, how the resources are allocated within the household. And there is extensive evidence that increase in women's bargaining power has positive effects on, their, on her child health and uh, here I've just mentioned the most um, famous uh, studies in that area and of course why women because they are the main care caretakers of children and a study of Philip also showed women um, bear the burden of taking care not only of children but also of other members of the family uh, also, because women's own health and nutritional status, status matters for the child before the pregnancy, during the pregnancy, after the pregnancy, during breastfeeding, and so on. And finally, there is a huge literature on cash transfer microfinance that has demonstrated that money and power in the uh, hand of a woman uh, usually is translated into better outcomes for their child in terms of health, uh, in terms of food, in terms of clothing uh, compared to men. So that's why I decided to concentrate on women's bargaining power. And finally, why Kyrgyzstan? So when I was reading the literature on bargaining power, uh, how intra-household bargaining power, there was lots of studies on Latin America, on Sub-Saharan Africa, even Middle East, uh, but no study on Central Asia. And um, according to the latest DHS, which was done in 2012 in Kyrgyzstan, uh, the figures for uh, nutritional status of children are not very positive. Around 18% uh, percent of children under five are stunted, 3% are wasted and three are underweight. And also there is other emerging problem of overweight. So children are overweight in the region. and. Of course, the critical factor was the life in Kyrgyzstan study. So this is the only study in Central Asia, to my knowledge, <clears throat> that has the panel data available that um, has not only household level data, but also individual level data and also community level data. And it's representative at national and regional levels. So that's why <clears throat> I decided to concentrate on Kyrgyzstan. And the I have two research questions that um, guided me throughout my research. And the first one is, what measure and proxies of bargaining power to use in the context of Kyrgyzstan? Because every context is unique. We can learn something from Latin America, we can learn something from Sub-Saharan Africa, but still the context of Kyrgyzstan with the Soviet legacy, with, uh, with the transition economy. So the measures, the proxies should, could be different. 
So what are they was my first question. And the second question was about the association, whether there is association between mother's bargaining power and her child's long-term nutritional status. And I measured mother's bargaining power using the decision-making index and her position in the household and the long-term nutritional status measured as height for age that score. And I'm gonna talk about these variables later in detail. So, and uh, why this study, why I decided to study this question? So what was my objective? First, of course, is to understand context-specific uh, factors of inter-household bargaining in Kyrgyzstan. For example, in some contexts, the bargaining happens between a husband and a wife, but in some uh, cases, especially in Middle Eastern contexts, the bargaining involves more people because uh, the culture is characterized by extended household, extended family units. So the bargaining might happen not only between the husband and the wife, but also between parents-in-law and other members of the family. And also too, the, the second objective is a bit ambiguous, given also that my study is just a correlation study, not the causal relationship study. But still, I wanted to inform future program designs and evaluations um, that aimed at increasing uh, bargaining power of women in, in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, so well, what I, if, if, um, if I find a positive association between the women's power and child nutrition, then it would mean that the policies should, um, such as microfinance project would be very effective. But my finding, I found negative association. So I found that women's bargaining power and child nutrition are negatively correlated. And it means that the policies should point at change in social norms. So it's exactly, I think, what Philip was uh, talking about, about the social behavior change program. So I think Kyrgyzstan is already implementing those. And uh, uh, my findings suggest that these are the most effective ones. So, and let's briefly talk about the stop and limitations. The first uh, thing is that I only concentrated on 2012 wave. So it's the third wave. And um, that's why my analysis are cross-section analysis. So I, um, I concentrated on that wave because I didn't have any data on decision-making and gender attitudes in earlier waves. I had, but they were not as extensive as the third wave. And also why I didn't choose the latest wave available at the point uh, at the time when I was writing my dissertation because um, there were some slight inconsistencies in the data uh, compared to 2012 data. So uh, education um, uh, variables were slightly uh, different. And also it was, uh, the study was conducted under the consortium of a different institution. So I decided to play it safe. I was a student and it was part of my master's dissertation. So I focused on one wave only, uh, the 2012 wave. And uh, I focused on households who have children aged zero to 12 years old, whose anthropometric measures, the age, the weight, the height were measured and whose mother was present and whose mother has answered uh, decision-making questions. So, and I just want to say that my findings once again are mere associations, not causal relationships. And also, unfortunately, not all daughters-in-law and mothers-in-law were I could, could, I could identify them because uh, head of the household, if they weren't the parents-in-law, then it would be difficult for me to identify whether daughters-in-law in that particular household were present. And also I didn't take into account of macro level factors, some conflicts, revolutions and so on. So, and I also, I think this is a limitation of the study that, uh, that strong in terms of bargaining power, because I couldn't take into account of assets brought to marriage, which the literature says is a strong uh, determinant of bargaining power, and also uh, like, like Colleen Price. There, there, were some, uh, th there was some data, but it wasn't enough to make analysis based on it. So, and my empirical study is a simple OLS where, where I used robust standard errors because, and I clustered the standard errors at the household level because I could have um, mothers and children from one household and they could have the same characteristics which were unobservable and they could be correlated. So that's why I took account of that. And this is my specification. So my, 
Um, dependent variable is the height for HZ score. And I also um, controlled for child characteristics, mother and father characteristics, also household characteristics and community characteristics. And BP here is my main bargaining power measure. I use different proxies and I'm gonna talk about it later. Uh, CH are the child and uh, health, um, uh, sorry, household characteristics. M and F are mother and father characteristics, community and oblast characteristics, like rural and urban, different oblasts. Um, and also my sample size, the final sample size uh, is uh, 2,000, uh, uh, 806 observations. So that's my final uh, sample size. So and now let's uh, talk about my key dependent variable. Why height for HZ score? Um, and what is that? This is the major measure of stunting. Uh, it's a long-term measure and it shows whether the person, the, the child has a long-term deficiency, health deficiency uh, as a result of poor nutrition. And uh, the reference data, since these are the standardized work, they are standardized based on some reference. And reference data I take from uh, WHO child growth charts. So the literature that I read, most papers use this reference, um, this reference data. And what I find is that in, in the sample, in, in particular sample, so 2012 sample, um, so here, all, almost 7% of children aged 0 to 12 years old are stunted. And uh, uh, in terms of other measures like wasting and uh, weight, weight for age set scores, so the sample size are lower. And also this problem seems not to be as Uh, I think I stopped to hear you. Vanessa Manu, please unmute your microphone. Yeah, I'm sorry. I think I had some something. Okay, okay. sorry. Please continue. Yeah. So let me draw back to my presentation. So now, yeah, so that's why I decided to concentrate and hide for age that score as a dependent variable and key independent variable. So what measures of bargaining power are there? Uh, and I'm uh, relying on Cheryl Doss, which is a bit feeder in intra-household bargaining power. So she suggests that income and employment is a root proxy for bargaining power of mother, asset ownership, human capital, like education. So these are uh, conventional commonly used bargaining power measures and I'm using them as well. But there is also decision-making and attitudes. I'm using decision-making index, which is which I construct based on 25 this, uh, questions um, that lead provided, like who made the decision, how much money to give uh, for a toy, yes, or or, or different type of questions. And um, th this index ranges from zero to one. It's a continuous index, and if it, the value is closer to zero, it means low decision-making power, and if it's closer to one, it means higher decision-making power. And also there are other context-specific measures which depend on the culture we are talking about. And in this particular case, in case of patriarchal Kyrgyzstan, I decided to use mother's position to the head of the household as a power of as a proxy to the bargaining power. So, and uh, let me now show you the distribution of mother's decision-making index. So if we look here, so the head, if the mother is the head of the household herself, then her decision-making power is close to unity. It's really high. Then if we go down the hierarchy ladder of the family, then we see that then if, if a mother is the head spouse, then her decision-making is slightly lower, but still not bad. If, if you are a head, if, if you are a daughter-in-law or, or just the daughter to the head, your um, power decreases and the lowest power is if you are the daughter-in-law. So, and what I also, um, what we can also see here is that uh, the decision-making of mothers whose child is stunted is 
slightly lower here than if your child is not stunted, but the difference is not very big, but, but still it's lower. So, and then I decided to look particularly not at the, uh, the general uh, combined decision-making index, but only at one question which specifically asked who made decisions about the child uh, who is the main decision make, who has the main decision making authority for child's well being? And what we can see here is that if you are a daughter in law, you are likely to answer parents in law. So it means that it is the parents in law who made decisions on, on behalf of your child. But if you are ahead yourself um, or a head spouse, then it's likely that you yourself made decisions or your spouse makes decisions, or you do it together with your husband. And um, um, what, what it shows, it shows that structural hierarchies indeed do matter. And uh, it's really crucial to take into account this hierarchical structures, gender and age-based um, uh, hierarchies in the context of Kyrgyzstan. So that's why, that's my uh, motivation, why I added mother's position in the household as a proxy to bargaining power. So, and my results are the following. So I, I added different types of proxies for my bargaining power. Some were significant determinants and some turned out as insignificant determinants of child's health. So what are the insignificant determinants? And it was really strange. For example, mother's locked monthly income it turned out as insignificant, but the sign was positive, but it was insignificant. Uh, and also mother's income as a contribution to the household monthly income was positive, but insignificant. And mother's employment dummy. So if she worked, then it, it was insignificant, but the sign was negative. It means that if she worked, uh, her child's um, health status was lower if she didn't work. So, and what were the significant determinants of child long-term nutritional status? Mother's position in the household turned out to be statistically significant. And also the head of household being female. And this um, variable was uh, really stable across all specifications uh, and very significant and always positive. What I found that children in female-headed households were on average healthier than in male-headed households. And also mother's level of education was statistically significant. So compared to illiterate, like being illiterate compared to having secondary education decreased the uh, standard deviation by 1.4. So it reduced the, like, the health. But on the other hand, having university degree uh, compared to having secondary education decreases has by the height for age that's scored by 0.46 standard deviations in urban sample. So, but my urban sample was really small, small like 30% of respondents were from urban areas. And uh, maybe it means that if a mother has university degree, she's more likely to work. She has more outside options. So rather than sitting at home and looking after her child, she, she's usually maybe working. So maybe that's why that's one probable explanation. And mother's decision-making index. Why it's in the middle? Because in some, specific, in, in some cases, it was statistically significant determinant of child health. In some, it was insignificant. So in rural sum sample, I found the decision-making is statistically significant determinant, but it's negative. So it means the higher your decision-making power, the lower the child's health. Um, and in urban sum, sam sam sample, mm, decision-making power was positive, but it was statistically insignificant. So it was really strange. And uh, um, I'm gonna explain you one post, I'm gonna, like share with you one possible explanation for this um, strange signs um, that we got here. So, and here in that table are my like final results. And here uh, are the results for my mother's position categorical variable, where the reference group is the largest group when a mother was head spouse. So we see that 
being a daughter and uh, being a daughter-in-law is like detrimental for your child. So, um, and it reduces your child's height for AGZ score by 0.74 standard deviations for daughters and uh, for daughters-in-law by 0.44 standard deviations. And also uh, decision-making index here, when I add it alone without accounting for mother's position is statistically insignificant. But once I add uh, this, ver once I add, uh, once I account for uh, mother's position in the household, then it becomes statistically significant at 10%. So, um, so what we learned, so what are the conclusions? My conclusion is that vertical extended familial units are more rigidly patriarchal in the context of Kyrgyzstan. And that in that sense, Kyrgyzstan is more similar to Middle Eastern countries than uh, like Sub-Saharan Africa or Latin American countries. And neither uh, income or nor education are as important as mother's position. Um, for your child's health. But one possible explanation is that lower degree of bargaining power might discourage mothers. So they don't, they just conform to these patriarchal norms and they just give up. They say, they know like, I'm just the daughter. And if you are like a daughter and living with your parents it mean, and you have a child, it means that you are either divorced or maybe other reason. And if you are a daughter-in-law living with your parents-in-law, you know that there is no point to argue. You just better do something uh, you just better conform to what your parents-in-law say and you don't really uh, show your agency but but we should be really dangerous with claiming um, such things because more qualitative evidence is needed and of course panel data more dynamic analysis would shed more light so and finally like Although these are just correlation analysis, but it's still important because this is the topic that is widely um, studied uh, throughout the world, the, the world, and we should be more willing to accept correlation analysis uh, in, in that um, for that topic. And I think, to my knowledge, I might uh, mistaken, but I think this is the first study to uncover the relationship between bargaining power of a mother and child health in the context of Central Asia, in particular in Kyrgyzstan, or maybe it's just my limited knowledge. Yes, and thank you very much. Uh, that's, yeah. If you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, I think, yes, floor is open to the questions. Uh, please raise your hands and I think the Nazir Banur will be happy to answer. Um, I can start. Yes, please. Um, thank you, Benazir. Um, it's very interesting presentation. We also claim that intra-household issues are the kind of type of research LIK suited most, and that's what you're doing. Uh, thank you for that. A um, couple of uh, comments, what you think about it. So your index of uh, decision-making power includes mm -hmm. the questions in that table. Um, did you consider some questions not being too much in the scope of deciding by women? I don't know. Um, I cannot think, think like agricultural activity or something like what to grow, what not to grow. Definitely some people have more say to certain things than others, but uh, taking everything what is there, maybe assigning zero to women who by functions more or less say uh, has uh, very little to say and need, doesn't need to say, you're kind of putting low weight on the decision making index of a woman in that respect. So your thoughts would be appreciated. From the other side, taking children of age 0 to 12, I'm more concerned about children who are a bit older. So we are kind of associating their health status with uh, what was kind of decision-making power of child when they were younger. 
So I assume young age is very important for this health uh, indicators. So in that respect, definitely decision-making power changes over time. It changes uh, depending on household structure and any other decisions. But definitely, I believe uh, women decision-making power, maybe on surface, is um, could be looking big, but definitely it's strong and it gets stronger over time, in my view. So how would you kind of deal with this issue that maybe her decision-making power was weaker, it's now stronger, and you are now using the stronger information now to kind of relate that what happened like 10 years ago. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for your comments. Uh, uh, in terms of decision-making index, yes, I was also like, there were so many questions and some were not directly related to child's health, but um, I, I separately made the index based on only relevant questions to child health, like child health, child name, and other ones, but they turned out to be statistically insignificant. And I think that when we consider all questions, they help us to capture the real power, like, I mean, the, the real um, bargaining that the woman has. So uh, in, of course, in one area, it might be stronger than in other, but uh, in, in my specification, when I use the decision-making based on all questions was stronger, but I, I, I try to look separately like based on only ch ch child health questions, but it turned out to be not really um, statistically significant. So that, that's one thing. And in terms of the um, zero to 12 years old, yes. Or in most papers, they use zero to five years old um, group sample. But since this is the long-term nutritional status, like uh, the height for age Z score and the WHO also provided the measures for uh, up to 15 years old. So, and also in order to make my sample a bit bigger. So this is the reason why I chose this range. Yes. So, and was there also, uh, you wanted to ask something else? Uh, I missed maybe. That's no? enough. Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, yes. Okay. yes. Uh, thank you very much. Very interesting quest, uh, uh, research and not uh, explored at all before something new. And uh, really, uh, it will give more qualitative uh, data, will give you more in depth uh, to this subject. And you can uh, do like uh, all over Kyrgyzstan and see the differences between north and south, between urban and rural areas. Uh, I have like a, just a comment. Uh, uh, recently, um, uh, we had an interviews with women in uh, southern Kyrgyzstan and asked uh, uh, not uh, uh, bargaining power, but we weren't conceptualizing it this way, but just how they get resources. Uh, and then they said uh, during toys celebrations, eh, toy, uh, toys and different events, uh, they, they, they bargain resources. Uh, and uh, not just for this celebration, but for the whole household and for their kids. So during, uh, they use uh, celebrations toys uh, to bargain resources from the decision makers, mostly husbands. So they say they can solve their problems during celebrations uh, using it as an, uh, as a, um, as an ex excuse, yeah? So this is very interesting also phenomena. Uh, and uh, uh, for, uh, again, about the, uh, you have these variables, uh, uh, education, yeah, uh, 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 work of a mother, yeah. What about the uh, uh, this uh, uh, mother's background, uh, family where she was grown up, her her parents, like mostly in Kyrgyzstan, they they say like you come from poor family and you don't have a right to bargain. I mean, you were you grow up in such a poor family and how you can demand uh, all of these life conditions for you, yeah, like this. Uh, this is very traditional view. Unfortunately, it is now happening also. Also in many families, so the um, status of a family of a, a daughter-in-law, whether it's uh, poor or rich or middle class, also uh, can be a good variable to look at. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Elira. And about the background of a daughter-in-law, yes, that's a good um, comment. 
usually the, in the literature, I think uh, scholars use assets brought to marriage, but I couldn't find information. And I think there were some questions about how much Kalim did you pay and so on, but, um, but only a few answered the question and um, preferably, like, perfectly, it would be great to find, to, 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 to know how, what exactly in terms of assets uh, um, a daughter-in-law brought to the marriage. So it, it, it will be like a proxy for her, um, uh, what do you call the family that she comes from, the, the, the social status, the financial status of the family could be proxied by this measure. Yes, and, and, and it's interesting that during toys, women become more empowered. <laughs> uh, I can add that you can have a look at 2010-11 data to bring parental background, education, and in some cases, even professional status. So that's uh, information Tilman and me used to uh, look at intergenerational educational mobility. Mm -hmm. So given it's a panel, definitely um, most women we are looking at should have been in the panel before. So uh, that's possible to control for at least on that respect. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I really need to do the panel analysis to do it, to explore further that topic. Thank you. Uh, do we have some more questions? Dr. Tilekev, I had a question. Here's the Lisa Mandiva. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, hi, sorry, it's just, and I don't want to, you know, uh, disturb much else, my questions, but uh, um, Benazir Bunu, thank you very much for your question, uh, for your presentation. You know, it's, I mean, it's very interesting for me also to see, now being new mother, you know, to see how it's actually <laughs> uh, the, the nutrition and the mother's role in the family uh, plays a role. Um, so um, I was also part of last year working with uh, LIT data and, um, you know, um, it's, it's very interesting, but sometimes you have to look a little around where you can get uh, the right um, variable. So I had a question about to control variables. So Elira already asked you, what's it about the social status of the family or of the, of the uh, mother-in-law or daughter-in-law and so on. Um, in this regard, have you used any control variables, which ones? And if you also try to work with the moderating variables, because this could also explain uh, for example, why education and employment of the mother uh, doesn't have any effect or, or, or if the effects, you know, higher or lower and so on. Maybe, yeah, if you, if you, if you have any ideas or comments, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Lisa, for your question. Uh, could I just clarify, what do you mean moderation variables? Because I think it's the first time when I hear this type of variables, moderation. Oh, sorry, moderating. So it's normally, you know, the control variables, you know, you control to in order, yeah. and then the, the moderating, I don't know, it's, it's in real, and then uh, how you said professional language. So moderating, I, I sometimes you see, when you want to see the, the uh, effect of the mother's education on nutrition, and then you can, you know, control for the family thoughts in general or, or income and so on, right? But yeah. you, you can, from the moderating, so it's uh, kind of the role of the uh, of the daughter-in-law, for example, could be a moderating variable of the you know the education and employment somehow moderated by the uh, role of the daughter-in-law in the family in this way. <laughs> so okay, maybe uh, Tamir, I don't know in, in professional language how you call the moderating variable um, intervening. What? I mean, it depends how you see the mechanism of change. Uh, yeah, I think mechanism. we tend to just call them control variables. I mean, yeah. definitely certain things cannot be neighbors, uh, so you have to remove some. So in that case, maybe exactly applicable that you may not apply something to for your outcome variable that highly correlational. So you have to bring something else. So that in that respect, so you cannot model wages by putting employment status, but rather you have to bring education because education moderates employment and through that effect you, but we tend to kind of test like uh, collinearity. So make sure that model is logical. And in that case, maybe that's uh, how we 
kind of our language, at least in economist, uh, operates. Yeah. So yeah, we tend to you. call them just control. Yeah. Control. Yeah. Okay, I got it. Yeah, thank you very much. So yeah, I had many controls, and I also didn't want to overload my specification. That's why I would I had to be very selective in terms of what controls I choose. I in all specifications are controlled for child characteristics like child's age, child's uh, gender, the birth order. Uh, and also in terms of household characteristics, the asset level, the household level, asset level, and the consumption, like a proxy for permanent income, and uh, also father-mother characteristics, um, father's education, father's ethnicity uh, and mother's ethnicity, and also rural urban, and also oblast dummies I always had because, and by the way, oblast dummies were statistically significant in Istanbul, the the, I don't know why, but the stunting was the highest, the prevalence of stunting was the highest. Yeah, and also in terms of ethnicity, some ethnicities like the Tajik, if you're Tajik or Uyghur, but I think it's due to maybe the sample is really small. Maybe that's why the, it was statistically significant. So I controlled for a range of other variables to account for household level characteristics. Um, community level characteristics and uh, parents characteristics y yes but what i played with is with the bargaining power measure so i added like i tried income i tried then uh, like education i tried your uh, employment status and i because they are very highly correlated because they um sh sh like the underlying distribution is very similar so that's why i Maybe you had the perception that I only looked at these variables and didn't add other controls. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Uh, sorry, can I ask uh, uh, one more question, uh, yes, if I may? Yeah. Uh, uh, have you looked at uh, information sources of uh, 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 mothers, uh, which information sources they use? Uh, because uh, uh, now social media, especially Instagram and Telegram, there are uh, channels, uh, accounts uh, like Instagram mamas. So they are sharing a lot of knowledge about how to bargain, how to bargain resources yeah, from family members. So uh, this is very important component information, uh, especially social media. So if mothers get this kind of articles they read or uh, advices they get from peers, yeah, from other women who are sharing their experiences, how they bargain it, uh, they, they also learn from each other. Yeah, yeah, great, great, great comments, Alira, thank you. Uh, yeah, actually, I really want to do a PhD and uh, what my, one of the research studies is that to look at social networks. Uh, so how not only the social networks in terms of the uh, IT social networks, but also social networks, the peer effects, the neighbors, their communication, how this affects the bargaining power. So that's definitely the area for future research. Yes. Thank uh, thanks a lot, Benazir Bono. Uh, it was a very interesting, impressive presentation. was very happy to hear. Uh, and I think uh, we need to close this session. Uh, thanks a lot and my congratulations to all participants and all. Uh, thanks a lot for all questions which was raised today. Um, what I want to say at the end uh, is that uh, um, definitely we want to see reports, articles uh, from yes. your side uh, and, and I think uh, we can, um, uh, you know, uh, we'll be happy to citation, increase your citation and to really enjoy uh, the reports and articles you produce. Thanks a lot uh, for today. And uh, tomorrow is the last day of our conference. And uh, I hope to see you again uh, on the sessions tomorrow.